I just wanted to preface, this is, what I'm talking about here is my experience. It's by no means the, the history of this art form and it's, um, it's certainly not, I don't speak as any authority for anybody else. I can only tell you about what I've learned um, and what I've done. Um, but what I have come to realise is that we're involved, we're all involved in this. This is a collective thing. This is something that's ha happening on a, a grand scale. Um, very different to what I understood when I was a kid, when I was living in Perth a, a long, long time ago. Um, I was one of those kids who, growing up, was always drawing, always drawing something, um, mostly depictions of monsters. Um, did my clicker working? But I was uh, totally enthralled by the illustrations that were animated in the opening series of Yes Minister, the Gerald Scarf drawings. I wasn't that keen on reading, but um, I was also enthralled by the illustrations of Quentin Blake that went along with Roald Dahl's books. For me, these illustrations added another dimension to the stories and expanded them and filled those stories out and filled my imagination in a way that a picture tells a thousand words. So for a while, drawing kept me quiet and occupied, something that I'm sure the parents of three young boys were pretty grateful for. But it didn't have a real sense of uh, purpose and a real sense of focus. As I got older, I was fascinated by the the 70s and the posters that were out, and Frank Fazetta was one of the, my heroes then, and also Ripley's Believe It or Not comic books that um, inspired and influenced the content of the image I was drawing. Still about monsters and still about people. So sometime around 1982, I discovered graffiti, the subculture of graffiti and the New York City graffiti, painted as pictures on walls and on trains. And it was the characters that went alongside people's names that really grabbed my attention. And so with no one to teach me anything, um, and no real reference other than the backgrounds of music videos that I'd see on Countdown and I'd s sort of try and fleetingly study, um, I just kept drawing for a while. And then uh, two friends of mine, a friend of mine from school and an another mate of his, we all decided that maybe we should turn these drawings into a painting. So we went out and got some spray paint, liberated art materials, I like to think of them, and um, went out night, at night and painted a water tank up in uh, Darlington. And it was from that moment I was hooked and I had a purpose. Like many people that grew up in Perth in the 80s, I felt very isolated and very removed from the rest of the world. And it's something that I'm really grateful for now, I think because it gave me a kind of a lost in translation sense about how I created my work. Um, but back then I wanted to be where it was all happening and where all, I felt that all the action was, which wasn't just New York, it was also Europe. Uh, places that I, you know, Europe I was born in, but I'd visited a few times, but. It's not a place that I necessarily understood and it certainly wasn't a place that I called home. But at the ripe old age of 16 in 1986, I was sort of subject to what I like to think of an inspired sense of reverse colonialism. So as I started to get in trouble, my parents decided to send me to the UK to live with my grandmother. And uh, as a result of that, see the world. So by July 1986, I was a 16-year-old in New York. I was riding trains through the South Bronx. I was meeting, talking, and hanging out with kids that were from New York that were painting tr trains and painting walls and receiving the kind of education that the traveling by the seat of your pants can give you. I learned so much, and it was, but it was also more than just graffiti and more than just trains and walls. I also learned about people like that were making different sorts of work in New York, people that were imbued with social and political commentary, and it reflected the city that they lived in. People like Jenny Holzer and her inflammatory essays had a massive, 
a massive impact on me. I studied these things. Um, John Fechner and Don Light were also massive uh, influences on this, the stencils that they did. That's a particular favourite. I also saw work by people like A1, who was a New York graffiti writer, and of course one of my absolute heroes, Futura. Doze Green was also one of my masters, and I was also really enthralled by Keith Haring's drawings, particularly when they related directly to a poster or, or advertising. And of course, Basquiat. So I returned to London in, back in 86 and uh, with a brand new perspective on what I understood of uh, creating work in the street. And I guess I added the whole thing of growing up in Perth and not having any restrictions and not having somebody to tell me what the rules were. I uh, felt a kind of freedom that I had got from learning to paint without anyone to teach me what was right and wrong. My materials in Perth were extremely limited, and that, but there was no one to tell me what I shouldn't, shouldn't do. And this is definitely something that I continue to subscribe to because... I feel for me it pushes my boundaries. And after all, I think having rules for anarchy seems counter to the concept. Seven years later, I returned to Perth and I had a wealth of experiences to draw upon and many different ideas that were consuming my thoughts. And I had crates full of paint, but I also felt a kind of emptiness with that. It was as if something was kind of missing from my work. I'd learnt to paint lots of different ways and with lots of different people. And I had lots of different colours. Um, and I felt that, you know, that palette was too great for me. There was too much there. I needed to go back. I needed to strip my work back. So I wanted to return to form and to the idea of drawing. So I set about restricting my palette. And my first exercise was to restrict my palette just to primary colours. And then I went to black, white, grey and silver. Having read a bit about art therapy, I wanted to assign emotions to those. So I have emotions that are assigned to these colours that are based on my experiences. So black is the accumulation of dirt. White is symbolic of the attempts to remove dirt. Grey is representative of the cityscape. And my final colour is silver. Silver is for dreams. I'm forever grateful for the way in which I grew up and the way particularly that this city has shaped me and prepared me for my journeys and informed and influenced my work. And now what I wished for back when I was a 16-year-old dreaming of cities abroad has finally landed on my doorstep in Perth. I think public is an amazing project and I'd particularly like to take this opportunity to thank everyone at FORM for the incredible amount of work that's gone into creating and executing public. It's certainly no small feat. And for me personally, it's as if I guess my life's come full circle. What I wanted when I was a kid was things to happen here, and I firmly believe that things are really are happening here. If there's a kid in the suburbs that after having experienced public can make something greater of themselves, then I feel that we've been successful. If there's a kid in another part of the world that sees public online and is as inspired to take action, then I think we've had an even greater success than we first thought possible. And I'd like to thank you all for being part of that.